Hey folks, this is Johnny and welcome to another Songwriting Simplified. Today we're going to get with Johnny like we usually do. And we've already got a couple of uh, pretty interesting questions, so we're going to go ahead and get started on those. So let's see, what am I going to do here? Give me a second. There we go. Had to resize my screen. Let's see if Johnny's ready. Where's Johnny? Who's Johnny? Who's Johnny? Is that a song? I think it is. <laughs> Yay! I'll bet my microphone's wrong. Correct. <laughs> I forgot again. <laughs> Although I had it all said for you last week. Oh, fudge muffins. <laughs> Fudge bucket. <laughs> uh, let's see if this thing will actually work for me here. There we go. See, it keeps going to the default, and I don't know why. There we go. That should be better. Yep, we got it. Sweet. Well, Happy New Year, Johnny. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. So sorry to have you up so late. I know it's really late where you are. I uh, do appreciate your flexibility, at least for the time being, until we come up with a better idea. But uh, uh, we... Mini me over there? Yeah. Yeah, I already got rid of him. He's over there now. There we go. We've already got 15 people in here, so that's pretty cool. That actually works. Uh, So uh, welcome, everybody. Songwriting Simplified. We are just going to keep it basic today, and we're just going to take your questions. I already pulled up all of my emails, and I have two people live over there on the Wix chat. So that should be quite cool. So how did you celebrate your New Year's, Johnny? Uh, I broke a few things. You broke um, You broke a few things. Excellent. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I did. I, I I broke some some wine glasses that we've had for um seventeen years. Is that like um a tradition or did you fall down? I I I just broke them. <laughs> <laughs> I just broke them. Okay. <laughs> it, no, it it wasn't deliberate. It was, yeah. I do like the lighting in your studio right now. I saw that picture that you posted with the cool lights and stuff all around. Yeah, I've I've got some uh, I got some nice um, LED lights. Nice that, that I got for Christmas from my beautiful wife, and oh, then my daughter. Cool. She said, "I know how they should go up in your studio." I go, "Okay," and she goes, "Don't worry, I'll take care of it." And she did. And she did. Very cool. All yeah, right. so the picture you see of, of uh, on my Facebook page, um, all of that is her handiwork. Oh, that sounds cool. That sounds really cool. I don't know if anybody here follows me on Facebook, but um, we uh, got my daughter a uh, brand spanking new. Uh, it was got a great deal on a Mac uh, Book Air Pro, or not a MacBook Air, MacBook Pro. Pro, um, yep. because uh, she needs it for the second half of school or would just make things easier for the uh, second half of her final uh, year in high school, and she'll be using it for some college courses. So with that said, and I want to thank uh, Grandma and Grandpa on my ma- on my wife's side uh, for uh, putting together a little college fund for her so she could get that. So awesome. guess what that means for me? You're back on PC. I no, I'm actually on I'm actually still on Mac here, but I've got the PC back. So I'm going to be stripping it down to the nubbins and I'm going to be doing a video series on properly installing Studio One and a few third party plugins on the PC. 
So no. it should be cool. It should be really cool. And I didn't realize how slow that PC was. I mean, it's a fast PC, but it takes forever to boot up. <laughs> oh, yeah. 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 It's an i7. It's got 32 gig of RAM. It's got two uh, one terabyte hard drives in it. So once it's up and running, it's blazing fast, faster than my M1 here. But, yeah. Uh, yeah, I got to work on uh, it booting up because I've uh, taken some calls and tried to help some people that have uh, that have been having issues getting stuff installed and stuff on a PC. So I'm going to see what I can do with that. Uh, Bobby Booth says staying with PC much cheaper. Now that I have to say, yeah, my daughter's MacBook was twelve hundred bucks. Ooh, yeah, ouch. yeah, it was. Yeah. Ouch. <laughs> I couldn't afford that, so thank God for the college fund for sure. Um, the uh, equivalent PC would probably run about six to eight hundred dollars, roughly. Yeah. Give, yeah, roughly, give or take, give or take. It's all yeah, it's almost about fifty percent. Yeah. yeah, I don't know that I'll go back to the uh, back to the PC for doing this because I've gotten so used to the Mac, and rebooting the Mac takes about twelve seconds, and that's it as to where the PC takes. Uh, quite a bit longer but i think for my bigger projects and now i can do my video editing back on the stuff i'm familiar with so i'll have both in here at some point so it's so it's quite cool but she is happy uh she can run minecraft on it so she's extremely happy so oh, oh yeah. yeah that was why she took my pc in the first place because she didn't have a pc that would run it uh for that but uh, all right, so let's see. So uh, you said that in our chat that you had our first question of the night, which is an interesting one. It is an interesting one. It's from it's uh, from Keith Chadwick, and uh, the the question is: Why does the modern piano have eighty eight keys? It's uh, <laughs> actually and, a good question. Is there a reason why it kind of starts at an A down at the bottom and is a C at the top? Um, and all of that, you know, was there some kind of design committee involved or anything like that? Well, in order to <laughs> answer that question, we need to delve back into the mists of time. We need to go back to the 1700s. Holy cow. And specifically, we need to go back to 1700s Europe Ooh. to answer this question. It's a, it's, a, it's a good one. And I've had to do a little bit of research. Oh. Mostly because I couldn't remember the guy that actually invented the piano. I couldn't remember his name. Oh, I knew he was Italian, but I couldn't remember his name. But I have I have found um, who it was. It's a guy called uh, Bartom, uh, Bartolomeo. That's it, Bartolomeo. Right, Cristofori, and he was um, um, uh, a technician working on harpsichords. That was his background, because of course there was no piano, so a harpsichord was the instrument. If you don't know what a harpsichord is. It looks like a piano, plays like a piano in as much as you press keys, but there's no hammer action that strikes the strings. There, instead, there's like a series of plectrums that pluck the strings. Right. So it's like a guitar for a keyboard, I guess. Um, and so the harpsichord was the the instrument of the period um, from around about the um, you know the sixteen. Uh, 1660s or 1670s um, but in around about the year 1700 so the turn of the century uh, Christofori who is this um, keyboard technician he was like a luthier for keyboards I guess you could call him okay. um, he came up with a, um, um, a new keyboard instrument with a hammer mechanism which is kind of what we have now and so he was hired uh, by the uh, Florentine court of the Grand Prince Ferdinando uh, de Medici in wow. about 1680 something, 1685 <laughs> or something, to look after their harpsichords. So that's basically what his job was. He he basically went to the palace and he maintained and looked after the harpsichords. And they had like seven or eight harpsichords in the palace, which is crazy. <laughs> yeah, I'll say. So. Um, so whilst he was doing that, he was also working on uh, designing and building this instrument that he had in his mind. Uh, because the thing with the harpsichord is it ha it doesn't really have any dynamics. It can't play; la it can only play one dynamic. It's not loud. It's not soft. It's kind of somewhere in the middle, and that's that's its dynamic range. 
it just plays one volume. That's it. So there was no real ability to be able to play softly or loudly as, you know, uh, and, and therefore <coughs> the, there was a limited amount of expression, which is why the harpsichord was really more of an accompanying instrument for soloists or as part of the rhythm section of the period uh, in orchestras. So orchestras back then were much smaller and you would have a cello and a harpsichord and that was the rhythm section. And so the, the harpsichord played chords, cello provided the, the bass low notes, and then you, you had your orchestra assembled around that. Um, but as I said, limited dynamically, couldn't really do a whole lot, but it was also limited in range. It only had a range of four octaves. So it was like, if you, you know those um, 49 key synths yes. or 49 key keyboards, it was that size. Really? So if, if you know what I'm talking about when I say 49 keys, that's the range of the harpsichord. Yeah. 49 keys. Yeah, actually, uh, my uh, keyboard uh, that I have under my console is a 49 key. 49, yep. yeah. And it starts on C and ends on C. So um, he was, as he was designing this instrument, he had to think of what to call it. And so um, he was kind of fumbling around with names, and uh, he came up with something called um, Arpich, uh, Art, I can't even say this, it's Italian. Um, Arpicimbalo, which when you translate it literally from the Italian basically means it looks like a harpsichord, but isn't. <laughs> nice. Which is not a great name for it. No. <laughs> but Cristofori basically created this instrument. And what it had was it had two keyboards, right? So two 49 key keyboards, one on top of the other. So if you, if you think kind of modern church organ or a Hammond B3, kind of looked a bit like that. Um, but it had this brand new hammer and damper mechanism. So you had a sustain pedal that, that lifted um, so the strings could could sustain and then you could damp and and all of that. So you could play loudly and you could play quietly. So um, he had a friend who also was a journalist called um, uh, Shippone Mafia. And Mafia basically described this instrument as and this is the Italian, he says, um, uh, grave cimbalo, cimbalo called piano e forte, harpsichord with quiet and loud. And this is where we get piano forte from, which is the full name for the piano. Wait, wait, piano say that again? Piano, quiet and loud. Piano what? What is the full name? Piano forte. Piano forte, okay. So basically means quiet loud. So uh, grave cim cimbalo basically means harpsichord, but it, you can play it loudly and quietly. Um, but it still had this kind of limited range. Um, but word started getting out in the sort of the, the 16 teens, so 16, 15, 16, 16, uh, sorry, 17, 16, 17, 17, 17. Word started getting out about Cristofori's invention and composers started writing more and more music for it because they liked the idea, hey, we can play loud, we can play quiet. We've got this dynamic range all of a sudden. Um, so, but because it was limited to four octaves, um, composers were basically like, could we not just like expand this thing so that we can write for a, a wider, um, a wider range? Because, you know, composers, they composed at a keyboard instrument. So basically when they wrote for an orchestra, the orchestra was limited to four octaves <laughs> because the oh. keyboard was limited to four octaves. Sure. So, you know, people like Haydn and Mozart basically said, hey, you know, we want the, a bigger instrument, not just so that we can write piano concertos that have a fuller sound, but so that we can write for an orchestra and know that we're writing the right notes. So it was extended to um, five and then six octaves. Um, but then by the time you get to the, you know, the 1820s, 1830s, um, and you get composer, pianists like Chopin and Liszt. Oh. Um, uh, they needed a bigger piano still. So it then went up to seven octaves. And finally, in about 1830 or 18, no, a little bit later than this, maybe about 1850 or 1860, um, a piano manufacturer called Steinway created the 88 key piano. So about 1860. And then finally they, they got the patent for it um, in 1880, I think it was. 
Um, and so Steinway's model has been kind of the standard ever since. And so a lot of other piano manu manufacturers, they followed this standard. So Bosendorfer and and others, they they basically went, yes, we will we will build our pianos to this this standard. Um, but uh, Stuart and Sons, British manufacturer, uh, just four years ago, created a nine octave piano with 108 keys. Oh, jeez. Didn't really catch on. Now, here's the reason <laughs> why it didn't really catch on. Well, you would think it would either go too high or too low, right? Well, here's the thing. Um, the 88 key piano, funnily enough, at its lowest and highest ends is just and only just within the human threshold of hearing. So to kind oh. of either extend upwards or downwards on the piano would mean the, the human ear would not really be able to hear it. And therefore, you'd have trouble detecting pitch. Um, but uh, Bosendorfer, uh, I mentioned them bef before, German manufacturer, they, they, cr um, they created, not so long ago, maybe about 20 or 30 years ago, they created a 97-key a keyboard, which basically um, um, except the white keys are black and the black keys are white which in that respect resembles the harpsichord, which was that way as oh, well. So the, okay. the, yeah, that's right. It was black and these ones were white. Um, that would look cool but, in my studio, a, a key, a keyboard with the key colors reversed. <laughs> yeah, you do see them. They, mm -hmm. they are around, as I say, Bosendorf make one. Um, and it's massive. It's 97 keys. And you, and you think, Hey, it's just another nine keys, you know? Yeah. That, that would be trippy to play says Keith. I wonder if that would have any effect on your ability to play the piano. I think the fingering would still be the same. Yeah. Right. But I wonder if mentally seeing the, the, the different keys, if it would affect you and slow you down in some way, <laughs> because you know, your brain processes from your eyes more directly than you think it does you, you have to reach more that's true i mean this this keyboard here my my nord is an 88 key keyboard right. so it's it's it is the standard right my big casio keyboard is uh fully weighted uh 88 key as well and my so if i had like another nine keys um if i'm sitting round about uh, there we that's go all right. if, I'm, if, you. if i'm sitting round about middle c which is where you're supposed to sit when you play the piano um, if I needed, you know, if I start, I'm having to reach to get those other nine keys. Yeah. You know, I mean, it's, it's a little bit of a reach, but it's, it's not much to get these. Yeah. It's not too much of a reach, but it, no. it is a bit of a stretch. It, but yeah, those extra nine keys. I would, would be, be interested in what it sounds like though. I mean, would it be even useful at that? I mean, because I'm, you know. I don't know how many songwriters actually use the upper echelon of keys for anything really constructive, only for like ambient ambiance and and you know being able to change the octaves, you know, during the course, uh, uh, you know, of a song. I I just I just because the high keys are so high in my mind, mm -hmm. to go another octave would be. <laughs> Wouldn't that be uh, like this? Wouldn't that be a dog listening range? <laughs> well, you have to bear in mind that when the piano was invented, there were no doors and there certainly were no computers. So the only way you, you would write music was with manuscript paper, a quill, a tub of ink and your keyboard. And so if you were writing for piccolos and let's say you wanted to harmonize to, uh, you know, first and second and second piccolos in thirds but way up the top you'd want to know what that sounds like oh that's so true okay that makes sense that's part of the reasoning why you know composers like mozart were basically saying hey let's 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 have more keys on on the piano yeah yeah shorty beard says he's got a keyboard with all black keys yeah, and and there are again there are keyboards like that where the the black keys are black and then the uh the what we would call the black keys here are a sort of a grayer shade of black. Oh, I see. Just a, just a dark keyboard. Yeah. My God, an itchy nose. There we go. <laughs> 
But yeah, that's that's a great question, Keith. And uh, you made you made me kind of reach back into into history. Like I said, I had to do a little bit of research, so I made a, a, a few notes, uh, which is what I was referring to there. But but yeah, most of that may just I just had to kind of like go, okay, music music history brain, music history brain, engage. <laughs> I'm trying to find some pictures and I can't find any. What, I For wanna, piano. Let's see, see. Piano. Let's see. Let's, let's go with all black keys. All black uh, keys. If I copy this it just, picture. It just, sounds, it just sounds so so. Cool, something different. Okay, I've got one. I've got one here. That picture that I've just put in our chat there, that's the picture of um, Cristofori's um, first piano that he invented. Oh, in our chat. Gotcha. Yes. Gotcha. Let's see where that is. So you should be able to grab that one. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and I've yes. got a I've got a picture of the the big Bosendorf ninety seven key keyboard. I can get that for you as well. Oh, there we go. All right, let me uh, let me do this, and then just do this. There we go. Look at that. But the but the but the uh, white keys still look you know kind of bright. Yeah, it, I mean, yeah, I mean in in that particular case with uh, Cristofori, he had kind of gone for this kind of white black kind of right. color idea. Um, but yeah, if you if I mean if you go and do a, a, a search in Google Images for harpsichords, yeah, that's oh there we go. Yeah, I, I didn't do harpsichords. Okay, so here's one. I'm having so much trouble. All right, there it is. So here is one. You can see right here. Now see that looks cool. I've got a little um Kawaii controller that has the reverse keys. But I was looking for like all black keys. Oh, there we go. There's all black keys right there. Looks like somebody painted them. <laughs> Okay, I've I've got a harpsichord here that has the the double manuals, the the two keyboards. I just I just kind of feel as a piano player that would be distracting to switch them all, to switch all the colors. It is amazing to th it is amazing to think that so much classical music we hear today was not written on a piano. Oh, is that true? What well, what was that? Sorry. Um, it is amazing uh, to think that so much of the classical music we hear today was not written on a piano. Well, anyth anything before um, anything before uh, 1730 would not have been written on a piano wow. because pianos were not really widespread yet. Um, only, you know, certain uh, certain people had them like Beethoven had one. <laughs> Mozart had one and Handel had one and I think that was probably about mm. it. There were only maybe four or five pianos in the world by, you know, the late 1720s. Ah, I see. But uh, the so once you get into the classical period, sure. Say, sure. You know, then more pianos start being introduced. Right. Most cuz monarchs would buy them, you know, as soon as as soon as they saw Mozart playing a piano concerto on his piano. Right then, you know, kings and queens would basically say, we want one of those. <laughs> yeah, right, exactly. Um, the anonymous housewife says she wouldn't like playing a keyboard with all black keys. It would be hard to see in the dark. You would need glow-in-the-dark note stickers to see your keys. Yes, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Kingston Dread uh, to Johnny Lipsham says, uh, Bernie Worrell from the Parliament Funkadelic. Had a Honer D6 clav uh, that had uh, dark camouflage keys. That's interesting. Correct. Yep. That's interesting. Papa Raptor says, I believe the 
Bosendorfer added the additional octave to the lower end of the keyboard. That's interesting. I did. Uh, I I'm not. I don't recall which, but yeah, that you may well be right there. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Vox made a combo organ. They called the Jaguar, yep, which, had which had reverse, reverse key, key colors. colors. Yeah, exactly. So I hold on. Yeah, Vox make some absolutely outstanding organs. If you're not familiar with them, they make the Farsifa organ, um, which I think is one of their most popular uh, model of organ. And you can get them oh. in the reverse color rather than black and white, white on black. Yeah. I've got the, uh, I, I said a, a Kawhi at first. It's uh, Akai. So, pardon Akai. my dyslexia. Yep. <laughs> so, this is yep. a nice little Perfect. controller. And you know what? This thing has something cool, and Studio One works with it really, really well. It's got a joystick that oh, yeah. you can assign through Control Link to any two controls for the left and well, one control for the left and right, and one control for the up and down. Makes and you can do some X, Y. Yeah, right, exactly. It really, really works nice. I wish that they had uh, just a joystick controller. If anybody knows if there's just a single MIDI controller out there with just a joystick, let me know because I can't put this on my desk because I have my Atom SQ and I have my Atom here. So this, this it's not a Personas keyboard. I, I think Personas needs to make a keyboard. Uh, I'm going to have to put that in my feature request. Yeah, talk to Dominic. Yeah, I, I will or, because or, or, I... Um, better still talk to Oscar. Yeah, I love the uh, Personas label, the PS49, which is made by another company. I can't uh, remember Acorn. the name. Acorn make those. Acorn, yep. that's right. And they are pretty cool. You can find them up on eBay and on uh, Amazon. So, And they're cool. The thing I like about the Acorn uh, manufactured keyboards is that the touch is really quiet. You know, when you press the keys, there's none of that synth clicking or anything like that, which I can't stand. And it's just really nice. I just like it the way it is. I'll see if I can get a link uh, to um, the uh, Personas keyboard here for everybody to actually check out. Yeah, we. Um, as far as I'm aware, we don't do those anymore. Yeah, yeah. You've got to you either buy the Muse or you buy them as part of... Um, uh, those kits, the um, music creation kits. I don't know if you remember. Yeah, those. which um, we don't do either anymore. <laughs> no, I know. Yeah, mostly because the the deal with Acorn came to an end, as far as I'm aware. That's yeah. That's oh, yeah. There is a couple. There's a couple up on Amazon. Let me see if I can get a link for everybody. For anybody that's interested. All right. So if you guys are interested. Go here to check out getting a Personas PS49 controller. Yep. Bam. There it is. All right. It's pretty cool. I like it. Right. Hit us with some questions, ah, Johnny. Okay, so... That's enough about pianos. We spent the whole first half of the show on pianos. Uh, yeah. Let's see uh, if I go to my Wix folks. Who is on Wix? Hold on. I got to use my fingerprint in order to get into this damn thing. Okay. There we go. All right. Let's see. Uh, Leon, he's actually got three questions up here. The first one is. Good grief. Uh, let's see. So Leon says, um, speaking of pianos. He says I made the tra the uh, transition from a synth style keyboard to a fully weighted keyboard, and boy, am I having trouble. Mm -hmm. Uh Would it be wrong for me <laughs> to return my weighted keyboard and get an eighty-eight key synth style keyboard, or should I just really hunker down? I haven't heard that term in a long time. Hunker down and learn the weighted keys is there an advantage or is it really just about being comfortable playing i uh, i would recommend you persevere personally yeah i would too there's something um, about the expression when you play a weighted keyboard yes there is and uh it does require a little bit of extra finger strength so 
you want to be careful that you don't push yourself so you end up with RSI or something like that. Um, so make sure that when you're playing a weighted keyboard action, your wrist is perpendicular to the piano. On a, on a, on a keyboard that doesn't have any weight, you can get away with your, your wrist being at most any angle. But if you're playing a weighted key, make sure that your wrist is perpendicular to the keyboard, not kind of up in the air like that. Or, or down, yeah. Down like that. It's got to be nice and perpendicular and relaxed so that the, the hand sits above the keys, kind of crab-like. Right. And then, so you have your hands in a crab-like fashion. And I would do some five-finger exercises with both hands for, you know, 10 or 15 minutes. I want to say a five-finger exercise. There's one that's really, really good. And this one, uh, you basically have a gap between your your first and second finger when you go up. But when you come down, you close that gap. And that sets you up onto the next note. I mean, the idea is with your fingers, you really need to drill your fingers into the keys. And oh, nice. you will feel after a few times of going up the, the scale like that, you will start to feel your fingers going, hmm, they are being worked. And that's not a bad thing. Right. Then do the same with your left hand, except this time the gap is here. Right. And then you want to do both hands together, obviously. Right. Um, right which will take a little bit of extra coordination. But once you've, once you've got that down as a drill that you do every day, when it comes to playing synth, this is relaxing. Yeah. yeah. Because there's no work involved. So you can play 50,000 miles an hour on one of these guys. <laughs> right. And you'll find that you'll play a lot easier, you'll play a lot more accurately on a synth if, if you've got the whole kind of weighted instrument technique right. down. Um, so it is very well worth persevering with. Um, but you know, just be careful not to push it too hard at first. Otherwise you can get repetitive strain injury. You mm. don't want that. Yes, definitely. Uh, let's see. So, uh, he's got a second question about, let's see. I'm, I'm reading it first cause it's a little confusing here. Um, I'm going to read the third question. Uh, Leon, uh, take a look at your question. It doesn't quite make sense, or maybe I'm just reading it with the wrong tenses. <laughs> it's, a, it's a really wordy uh, question. All right. So anyway, uh, the next one is um, you said that Studio One does the uh, transposing for different instruments when you're actually working on building a song with different musicians. Uh -huh. Is there, he's asking, he says, is there, I don't know if this is right, Um, is there a way, I, I see I'm not familiar with the, in, the instrument, is there something for the marimba on there? I have a marimba and it's not okay. tuned exactly to my piano and I can't figure out if it's a pitch change or if the marimba is just really badly out of tune. Boy, okay. I'm... Now, my question here would, would be, I, I hate to answer a question with a question, but okay. this is important. Is he talking about a literal marimba as in real wood note bars? Because if he's talking about real wood note bars, you're not going to be able to tune that to anything. It's fixed. It's wood. You can't tune it. But if he's talking about um, one of those electronic, um, you know, uh, mallet instruments like the the Pearl Mallet Station, for example, then yeah, you can change you can change the tuning of those. Sure. But real actual wood marimba, you can't. Yes, fit. yeah. He says it's real mar It's real wood. It's all real wood. And when I go up and down the keys and test each note, it's way off by the end. How could that be? Boy, that's a good question. Uh, it could be that either your keyboard that you're referencing is is not in tune, or 
um or the the wood of the instrument has has got warped somehow uh that could that could affect pitch like if if your marimba is is you know not kept in a in a cool dry yeah. environment like if the yeah. get, if it gets moisture into it the wood is going to expand it's going to contract uh, according to heat and moisture okay. That's and that's probably will... what it is because he just typed he says when I play the instrument by itself, it sounds fine. But when I try to play with other instruments, it it's just way off. It was stored in yeah, a very cold sounds... storage space for many years. Okay, I yeah. think that that's what happened. That's probably it. If it yeah. sounds fine on its own, the pitch of the instrument is not going to change. Right. It's just that other instruments, when you bring in other instruments, will 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 make it sound like the marimba is off, but it's yeah. not the marimba that's off necessarily. Um, I mean, <laughs> although you know, if it's been stored in uh, in a moist environment for a long time, yeah, then it was in a storage wood. space. It was in a storage space. He said that okay. will affect the wood, and yeah. therefore that will affect the pitch of the wood, and so the pitch of the wood may well have drifted. There's nothing right. you can do about it. However. In Studio One, if you're using virtual instruments in Studio One, you can tune those so sure. that they, they conform sure. to your marimba. Well, because the marimba is set up just like piano keys. You get three, two, three, and then, you know, it, it's set up just like a piano. Am I correct? Yeah. That's what I thought. That's what I thought. Yep. Because yep. I, like I, I for just like a glockenspiel, they're all laid out right. piano key style. Right, right, because I repair the marimbas for my daughter's uh, band. Yeah, uh, because they keep breaking the uh, <laughs> the um, solder joints in the pipes <laughs> that do the amplification. Yeah, yeah right. in the uh, resonator pipes. Yeah. Right. Okay. So let's see. Um, Joseph, uh, he is a new member over at home hst home studio trainer dot com. He said, "I just turned uh, tuned into your show the last couple of weeks. Thank you guys for going through all of this." Some of the subjects don't really pertain to me, but maybe you guys can help me with this one question. Uh, oh, actually, yeah. So we've actually gone over this before. Um, I'm looking at buying Notion for my, oh, I guess he's a teacher, for my sim, uh, symphony classes at the high school I teach at. Um, is Notion compatible with Studio One's, uh, uh, he put nomenclature. I think he just means the staffing. Is it compatible? Can I move files freely between the two systems? Yes, you can. Good. Um, now if, if he's an educator yes. and he's working in a school and, uh, he needs multiple, uh, licenses for, you know, a bunch, oh, yeah. a bunch of computers for the, the the kids to have access to. Um, he can uh, uh, he can fill out the contact form on the personas.com website, and he can request um, uh, details about an uh, an uh, educational site license. Okay, because that's what he would that's what he would need. Um, so, so the kids all have access to to Notion as well. But yes, you can send to and from Notion um, to Studio, Studio One. One. Oh, okay. He says he's already got a, a six package deal for teaching for Studio One and is interested in doing the same with Notion. So you yep. say it does with both, and I can get the education discount with that. Yes. Yes. Yeah. If yeah, you're a school, get, I think you need get to get a site license. Yeah. Yeah, you need to prove you're a school, though, right? Uh, yeah, he will. He'll need to reach out to to um uh to uh Prusonis. Okay. All right. Cool. <laughs> Three thumbs up from uh from Joseph. Very cool. Yeah. All right. So let's see. I got one more question. Oh, from Rebecca. Rebecca, it's good to see you back up and around. She's been going. Yeah. Through, she's been going through some really serious health issues. So. She says, I am doing much better, thanks. Uh, my question is, when I am recording my piano with two microphones, I'm getting this swishy sound between the two microphones, and I have to shut one microphone off. What is that? I can answer this, and Johnny can confirm. One of your microphones is out of phase with the other. 
So when they're mm-hmm. out of phase, you're going to either lose a lot of low end or you're going to get some weird kind of wavy sounds in between. If you record the microphones on two separate tracks, you can change, you can flip the phase on one of them and see if that corrects the issue. If mm-hmm. you are recording both of the mics on a stereo track panned left and right, you're probably not going to want to do that so that you can flip the phase. Now, one of the plugins has a phase flipper for stereo track. That's that the binaural pan? Uh, I think so. Yeah, or it might be the dual pan. Might be the dual pan. One of those two. Ah, uh, she says. Uh, she says thanks. I was just practicing. I'll record them on separate tracks and use the phase button on the track. Perfect. The thing to do, the thing to, do to avoid even having to phase flip is to make sure that the the capsules for the microphones are exactly even. Oh, and make sure they're not facing each other. Make sure they're not facing each other, and also make sure that they are even so that the sound from the piano hits both microphones at exactly the same time. Gotcha. (laughs) She types, aha! (laughs) So if you've got one like this and one like this, then what will happen is sound will hit this one first before it hits this one. Yes. Then you you will get uh, phase cancellation. Yes. Yeah, Shorty Beard says it's about the distance between them. You can also adjust the positioning of the mics, of course. Yeah, and I think, uh, okay, she just popped in. She says, yes, they were facing each other to a certain degree. I will try that first. Yeah. Excellent. All right, we have 22 people in here, and we have 16 likes. If you guys could, please hit the like button and let YouTube know that you like what we're doing here. It would really help the channel more than yep. you could possibly imagine. My persona says, says uh, otherwise, a.k.a. Rich Crespel, he says remem- marimbas are susceptible to atmospheric conditions anything made of wood for that matter yep absolutely yep. and then that makes that makes total sense especially since he said it was stored for years in a non-temperature controlled storage space yep brett marlow referring to rebecca's question about microphones says xy patterns shouldn't cause phase issues no it shouldn't i mean space pair will work just as well you sure. just want to make sure that they are that, that they are exactly evenly positioned between the instrument and right uh the capsules um but yeah xy will work just as well one capsule over the top of the other yeah, that'll that's, work that's pretty foolproof but the uh stereo spread won't be as wide that's the big difference with the XY, unless you really go to the far end of the keys in your performance. I really like the um, I really like the uh, sound of the pianos that where it's the two mics equal distance from each side of the piano aiming down to really capture the sound. That's how I've always done it. Yeah, I mean, to to be honest, whenever whenever I record um, a real live piano, I, I multi mic, I'll have. I'll have a space pair uh, towards the the bottom end of the piano, if it's a grand piano, towards the bottom end of the grand piano. And then I'll have um, another set of mics in XY, kind of like that. Right. Pointing down to to the center of of the instrument. And then I'll have a mic underneath the soundboard. Oh. And then I'll have a couple of room mics. Well, they're not room mics. They're kind kind of overheads, I suppose. That just capture a little bit more of the ambient sound of the mic of the uh, of the piano. All right, we have uh, another very important question from Rebecca. She says, "Can you show us a picture of Elvis?" <laughs> <laughs> there he is. He is just chilling and just kind of listening to what we got going on here. He's napping. He had a good day today. He got his nails trimmed and he got a bath. And uh, tomorrow he gets a checkup. Because uh, his previous owner left him with some pretty nasty bruises on his uh, backside. And we're going to get them checked out and make sure that uh, that he's okay. So there he is. That's my dog, Elvis, who has now... It's so funny. I adopted two kids way back when, and my two kids have adopted Elvis. So I don't see him much. He's always with them now. But uh, But it's all good. It's all good. Well, I've got to say, um, Elvis Cam gets my vote. Oh, okay, good. (laughs) 
That works. That works. And uh, he just doesn't know it, so don't tell him. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> That's cool. He has. He stays down here at night with me when I'm working in my night job, and he's just such good company. Although he doesn't let me sleep when it's time for me to go to bed. He's actually up and around at 5 a.m., and that's my bedtime. <laughs> doesn't really help at all. All right, let's see. What do we got here? Uh, Billy Morgan says, Mixtool has the invert. Yes, okay, that yeah, makes sense. There you go. <laughs> Elvis is on his throne, says Brett Marler. Exactly. We have 27 people in here. Very, very cool. So we got 27, and we have... We have 19 likes. Okay, cool. Please hit that like button, folks. Really appreciate yep, it. Smash that sucker. Smash it. <laughs> Just don't don't break your computer because I can't afford to pay for a new computer for you. All right, let's see. Um, I don't see any. Did I miss any questions in the chat, Johnny? Could you double check? I don't see any. Uh, no, no, I do not. No? Okay. Uh, um, that. But... Uh, the, there's a little bit of talk about um, how to invert phase, and Shorty Beard correctly says invert phase is also a button if you enable input controls on the mixer. Correct. Yes. Exactly. Yep. That's that will do a, a full 180 uh, flip of yep. the phase, reverse of the phase. Absolutely. Clarity. That's the word. Clarity. Okay. So uh, here's another question uh, from Joseph. Uh, let's see. He said, speaking of microphones, <laughs> he says uh, the the orchestra that I am teaching, there's 12 of us, um, a, uh, a wide assortment of instruments. And I have been trying to record something decent so that I can actually teach them the mistakes that they're making. Would I be better off with a single mic in the middle of the room or maybe two, three, maybe even four in the four sections that I have on the floor? It is a very good room. It is actually the stage in our auditorium, and the sound is fabulous. What would you suggest? Johnny, I'll let you take that. If you've got a Zoom recorder with a, with a, with a um, stereo mic, <laughs> And I think there's the H, is it the HS6? That yes. Has the in the XY config. That's what I was going to say. <laughs> yeah. Smack that one kind of, um, kind of, a, a, I guess, at a, um, con conductor perspective. Sure. And um, you can bring those files into Studio One very easily for uh, further editing, and it will put everything on a separate track. So it's actually quite cool so how those... Uh, and that that will give you a nice little stereo stereo capture. Yep. Of, yep. I mean, you're not going to be able to do a lot mixing wise, but um, right. but that that's one really uh, cheap, easy, effective yep. way to good scratch recordings where you can yep. you can just listen to play. You can have your orchestra just listen to playbacks so they can hear right. you know where they're going wrong. Sure. Um, but if you want to really go for it, and if you've got a a, a digital mixer that's got enough inputs, <clears> then <throat> why the heck not you know and you've got enough mics you can throw up you know sure. chuck up a bunch of stereo mics over each section sure and um for my daughter's orchestra i've done it really simply i have from my drum miking cabinet <laughs> i have four sm57 microphones and i have taken my uh my uh personas uh what the heck was it called the four input one i don't remember uh the Oh, you know, it's the real old one. <laughs> it's got four inputs. Oh, um, uh, the, the uh, 44 VSL. Yes, 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 44 VSL. And literally, they have these hooks on the ceiling above where my daughter's band plays. And I have just simply hung straight down four SM57s, captured them all in a, in a laptop in Studio One. And then, of course, you have the ability to flip the phase and stuff like that. And that actually works really good. I like the, I like the SM57s as opposed to the SM58s as the 57s are a little bit more directional. And they'll pick up and kind of isolate whatever it's standing over instead of picking up the whole room and getting a lot of bleed. I've got some really, really good balances and just adding a little bit of plate reverb. You can actually put things back and forth in the mix as well and kind of make it sound like it comes around you. So mm -hmm. uh, there's another suggestion for you. Yeah, I mean, um, way back <clears throat> in, I think, what, 1989, maybe 1990, I recorded a big band that I was, I was playing with. Um, 
and we 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 just we just chucked up two SM57s, at, uh, not SM57s, 58s at the ah. back of the hall. At the back of the hall, behind the audience, in the center, um, just just basically pointing directly like that. Space pair pointing directly to, towards the center of the stage. And uh, it, the recording we got back, it was just like, it, it sounded fantastic. Just just a stereo recording and we like, like you say, you know, if if the room's a little bit dry, you just add a little bit of reverb to it, and um, it it sounded really really cool, and everything was in a really good balance. You know, okay, it's a stereo file; you can't really do any any balancing or anything like that. But to be honest, we didn't really need to because the balance we got from the stage was was just fine. Well, yeah, it also depends on the room you're in. The room you're <laughs> in makes a lot of difference to uh, what the microphones pick up. And my uh, voice is uh, running out of uh, steam here. Uh, let's see. Uh, Johnny, could you read Sean White's last entry yeah, there? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, 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 I can pretty much take over from this point. Uh, if you need. Yeah, that would be great. I'm really rough. Today. All right. Sean says, uh, be sure to actually check the waveform for phase issues. You may find that sliding the track into phase can produce even better results depending upon how much you want to get into the issue. Yeah, absolutely. Um, for sure. And the best way to do that really is to is to look at the two waveforms, zoom in, look at the two waveforms and look where the peaks and the troughs are. And then you can you can try and line up those transients. So if they're a little bit off or if you find that where one uh, one is peaking and the other one is troughing, then you know that those are, are completely canceling each other out and you can move those so that they're not doing that. Yes. And the, and the transients line up and then. By doing that, just by just literally just uh, clicking and dragging the waveforms until they until they are in phase, you might get better results than using the the um, polarity invert buttons. Absolutely. For sure. All right, let's see. Um, Wayne Goldman says the SM57 is amazing on my snare drum for live situations. I still think out of all of the fancy mics you can get for the snare. The SM57 is still the best. It just has the right sound. That's what I've I've used in recordings uh, on stage in pretty much every situation where I'm recording a drum set. It's an SM57 on the snare every time. No question. Yep. No question about it. Right, sorry about that. All right, very cool. Got a like from Neil Thompson. Thank you. We have 24 people in here, and we have 22 likes. Yes, thank you very much. I appreciate go. that. That's that's pretty much even Stevens. That's what we wanted. Yep, exactly. All right, Billy Morgan has a post. If you go a little bit back up the chat for, let's see, what is that? Uh, Ziggy's Studio One Meetup. Yep. Yeah, guys. Central. Yeah, go check that out. What is that? That that starts at eight. What's well, eight? Oh yeah, eight central. That's in six minutes time. So yep. perfect. Excellent. All right. So let's see here. I'm yes. Going... When we're done, you can you can all head over there. I'll be heading to bed because it's two a.m. here. So. <laughs> uh, let's see if you go up to about seven forty-five, Johnny, in the chat. Brett Marler has another post up there. Uh, I don't have the timestamps. Oh, yeah, you can change that with little dots up there. Uh, let me see. And of course, the timestamps are going to be in my time, not yours. That's true. <laughs> I'm talking about where he talks about um, microphones. Yeah, the uh, two hemispherical patterns. Oh, yeah. The two hemispherical pattern mics are also great for recording pianos. Just have to make sure they're placed at the same distance. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Again, that's that's another great way of, of capturing a piano. Uh, and it, as you can see, if you're capturing any source with more than one microphone, you're gonna you're going to likely have to get around the potential for um, phase problems because you've got to make sure that the sound from that source is going to hit both microphones at the same time. So even if you're recording in a spaced pair. Let's say you're wanting to capture, um, I don't know, acoustic guitars. Let's say you've got a, 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 um, a, a nylon strung acoustic guitar playing, I don't know, some Segovia, for example. And that's what you're wanting to record. So you maybe, you maybe will have a close mic in, uh, a, a, um, 
kind of, you know, round about the, the 12th or, or 14th fret, pointing towards the sound hole. And that might be your close mic. And then maybe you've got another close mic that's um, towards the, the bridge end of, of um, or the saddle end of the, the guitar pointing again towards the sound hole. You got to make sure that those two mics are the same distance away from the instrument um, in terms of this, this lateral distance, not kind of the same distance from here to this mic. These mics can be any distance, but if they are the same distance from the instrument, then the sound from that instrument is is going to hit both mics at the same time. Likewise, if you're going to um, capture in an XY configuration from further back, maybe another foot away, you've got to make sure that those mics are kind of, you know, the two capsules of the, of the mics um, are positioned in such a way that sound is going to hit those two mics at exactly the same time, which is why when you're recording drums, all your close mics, are fine. You're not going to have a great deal of phase problems with your with your close mics, but it's your overheads and your room mics. That's where you need to make sure yeah. this tape measure <laughs> is very very important. You got to have one of these guys. <laughs> you got to measure from the snare drum to each one of your overhead microphones to make sure that they are exactly the same altitude to the snare drum, and then your room mics, if you've got them in this corner and this corner again you've got to make sure that they are exactly the same distance from the drum set right and um making sure <clears throat> uh gosh the voice is almost gone uh making sure that uh if you have room mics uh some people point the mics toward the corners of the room and yep. some people mic them away from the corners if you mic them toward the corner, you're actually at the mercy of the room dimensions as far as any kind of issues. If you're actually aiming them towards the drum kit, away from the corners, uh, what Johnny said, uh, you have to be darn sure that the measurements are accurate. Otherwise, you're going to end up with all sorts of slapback and what do they call it, uh, flutter echo and stuff like that. And that's just going to make your drum sound terrible. Yeah. Uh, yeah, absolutely for sure. I mean, and there's this there's actually good rationale for one if you're going to capture the room, maybe point the the mics away from the drum set so you're capturing yes. just the room, which is what you're talking about. But again, making sure that the the mics are the same distance away from the walls and yeah. so on. Exactly. Mika is here. He says to be completely accurate, multi miking involves compromise. Of course it does. It it absolutely does. It is a compromise. Uh, you know, the the best way to capture anything is with one microphone because yes. then you're, you know, <laughs> you're not going to encounter those issues. Yes. It, and it was long and wide. There's no way that all waves arrived at the mic at exactly the same time. Adjusting phase, not just... Yeah, exactly. Sure. You're going to have to adjust and account for phase because of the dimensions of, of any instrument. Sure. Um, sure. You know, but we you want to try and get as close to to it as you can with with mic placement so that you're not having to do it after the fact quite so much right which is where a lot of beginners go wrong you know they they don't take into consideration the room that they're in you know if you have like a rectangular room you really got to do some testing especially if you're going to be miking an acoustic drum kit you don't want to be putting it in front of the furnace and the hot water heater where all of the distances and reflections from what you're doing are going to be different. Make sure you have a solid wall behind you on the drum kit if possible, or even a corner works. But even a corner is going to give you uh, some issues, too, if you're using multiple mics. You know, it's so funny because if you go back with some of those early Beatle albums, there was one mic at the right height and the right distance from Ringo's kit. And some of those drums just sound phenomenal. There's plenty of kick drum. There's plenty of everything. There's plenty of overheads. And they just, well, of course, they were working with really good mics, too. But everything is just the right distance. And you don't even have to worry about face problems. Yep. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I've, I've, I've done recordings with, with big bands where yeah. um, my drum set was mic'd with two overheads and one kick drum mic. Yeah. And sometimes actually just one mic pointed right. front right. of the drum set and it captured the whole drum set yeah. from the front. And even that can sound phenomenal. Oh, yeah. Well, especially if you've got a lot of different instruments and you've got a lot of competing sounds, 
you can take a not so great stereo sounding drum kit and place it right in the mix and it just works sean's got a good question here he says is the topic of phase cancellation only relevant to multiple mics on the same source or can you have issues between different sources i suppose kind of yeah uh, i think but, so you know back in the 40s and 50s one of the things they would do if they were recording a live band um, and they wanted to get separation from the different instruments if they if they weren't going to use gobos and, and baffling and that kind of thing which they didn't always then they would use microphone rejection to do that so having a microphone facing the drum set but having the the upright bass directly opposite oh i see then the bass is only going to be the sound from the bass is going to hit the rear of the microphone so it's not necessarily going to be captured you're going to get much more of the direct sound of the drum set than you are of the bass because of the bass you know hitting the back of the microphone so you can use um the rejection aspects of of a condenser microphone uh to help you with separation um there's a really good video on YouTube that's about 10 years old where they 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 go to this studio that was uh, that was built in the 1940s and um, it still works to this very day and they're still using 1950s recording and mixing techniques. <laughs> nice. <laughs> they make fantastic sounding records. A lot of country artists go to this studio um skiffle bands they go to that studio because you know they they get that gorgeous warm 1950s sound that you you really don't get in modern studios much anymore hey. um and mika's making some great points about uh the room's reflections sometimes rooms the room reflections can be a handy thing to have and sometimes eh, not so much sure. um which is why you know acoustic treatment is a good thing for yeah. sure definitely oh absolutely Oh, hey, I got to get going, Johnny. Thank yep, it you. It is time. Yes, uh, thank you for, oh, your um, ab your ability to adjust your time a little bit for the Wednesday night show. I really do appreciate it. And uh, at some point, we'll figure out, um, you know, we'll figure out a solution so you don't have to stay up so late. But I wanted to thank you for doing so. It's not. It's not a problem. It, it 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 really is not a problem. And the reason why it's not a problem is that the thing that you got to bear in mind here is your audience. Yeah, true. You know, you know, uh, you, there's a, there's a, a certain amount of expectation of what time things happen on a channel. It's like with any TV station. Sure. You know, if sure. a, if a show has been at six p.m. for ever. Yeah then your audience will turn up at 6 p.m. whether you advertise it or not. They're going to turn up at 6 p.m. because they go, that is when that show is on. Right. right. So you, you've only got a certain amount of flexibility with your audience. And so that's, that's what true. you've got to work. That's true. I appreciate that. And um, uh, Kevin was uh, very pleased that I didn't make him move his show um as we share many of the same viewers and everything so i gave up the tuesdays so that he could do his show on tuesdays at seven o'clock so that his time uh yeah my time yeah seven o'clock my time which is what he's always done it because going an hour later just to make room for my show would have made it tough for him so um that was good and i get an extra night off and i can plan a little bit better so that sounds cool there you go it works out well for everybody. I think. Yes, I think so, too. All right. So, uh, Johnny, say goodbye to the folks as only Johnny Lipsham can. Happy New Year, Happy everybody. Happy New Year, everybody. Happy New Year, everybody. Happy New Year, everybody. <laughs> and he means that as many times as it repeated. <laughs> yes. <All right. laughs> Good night. <laughs> All right. Cool. Uh, take care, Johnny. And thanks again. Cheers. Cheers. And Johnny has left the building. But Elvis is still here. Is Elvis still here? Yeah, he sure is. Oh, he heard his name. His eyes is open. Elvis. Elvis. You know, my dysphonia keeps me from saying his name at the same volume. So sometimes he hears me and sometimes he doesn't. <laughs> anyway. All right, cool. I want to thank everybody for coming in. Thank you guys for sticking with me through all the changes and everything. Good things are coming and a whole ton of videos 
for the channel are coming for Studio 1-6. Very, very small, to-the-point videos for Studio 1-6 based on the questions that you guys give me every day. So that should be cool. I do thank you guys for the support. And these are going to be my last few words. Later.